I'm sure you're all, I'm looking at your photos over there and you're probably actually better photographers than I am. Um, but what I am is a really good editor. I love editing. And I've got a slightly weird mind that allows me to think up really odd scenarios. So if I see something um, like a chandelier, that looks like a skirt for a ballerina for me. Um, so I'm always looking outside the box to try and find different things to make these weird visuals that, I don't know, touch a part of my soul. Um, I've always been a, a fairy tale kid. Um, and so to help you understand a little bit of the reasons I make the images that I do, I'll explain a little bit about myself. Now, this probably, some of the, sometimes when I tell people a little bit about myself, they do the, oh no. Um, but my life has been very good and very happy. So, um, and this is a result of finally feeling freedom in my soul. So, um, my story is completely tied up in my art and my art has become my story. So, we'll move on. So, I'm 11th of 12 children. Yes, we were Catholic and yes, we did have a television. Um, <laughs> my father worked at the Ford Motor Company in Geelong as a labourer and we lived in a three bedroom commission home with a bungalow attached. We had a, my beautiful Irish grandmother who, you know, let me point to her. That's her right up there, that's me by the way. Um, my Irish grandmother also came along quite often to live with us. So, as you can imagine, the house was absolutely chaotic most of the time. Unfortunately, it's a little bit easy to get lost in a family so big, and it happened that I was also being sexually abused by my older brother from around the age of two. But at the age of three, with the help of mum and this beautiful little book there, which was a read-along Mary Poppins book, um, and every time it was time to turn the page, Tinkerbell would ring a bell and I knew I had to turn the page. And I learned to read at three, and that became my saving grace, because while awful stuff was happening to the little girl, I was in the Banks' nursery with Michael and Jane, or I was in the faraway tree with um, Dame Washalot and Moonface. So I learned to escape into fantasy and separate myself from that little girl. My Irish grandmother, who was the most superstitious, amazing woman in the world, she fed my imagination with tales of the banshee and wee folk and fairies and selkie and leprechaun and, of course, angels, because, as I say, we were Catholic. Um, and I was obsessed with what people say is the mythical world, but I still had my doubts. I think it might be true. So anyway, I grew up more normal than I really had any right to be. I got married, had three kids, and life seemed okay until it wasn't. So about nine years into the marriage, my ex, they're my brothers by the way, they're not my ex. Um, um, about nine years into the marriage, he became violent and we broke up. But he didn't cope well with that, so he started stalking me. So for four and a half years, we went through hell on earth until about four and a half years after the separation, um, three children went on an access visit and only two came home. My daughter was killed on that access visit. So I try to raise my sons in amongst grief and depression because life doesn't stop for kids, they just keep going. Um, but it was a nightmare and as a parent you do what you can to ensure their lives are the best that they can be. Um, three years later I nursed my mum while she was dying of cancer so we had to build our lives back up again. And, um, and we did, we were happy, we were a very close knit family, the boys and I are still very, very close. Um, but as they grew up, I started battling mental illness. I probably always had depression and anxiety, but it got a lot worse and I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so it got a lot worse as they grew up because they didn't need me to the same degree anymore and I felt a bit superfluous, to be honest with you. So we decided as a family to come up to New South Wales from Victoria. I was born in Geelong. Um, and we decided that this was going to be a whole new start that was exactly what I needed. Um, but realistically, I was just taken away from my whole support system. I had no extended family, I had no friends up here. I was desperately lonely, I couldn't find work. Housing is not great up here. Um, and so my troubles just came with me. Um, and one day after another emotional blow, I was so angry with the world that I was gonna write a book and I was going to out everybody that had ever crossed me and I was just furious that day. 
And my oldest son, Lachlan, he's a very calm boy. I don't know where he's come from. He's so calm. Um, and he suggested that I write a book first because I'm very full of a china shop. I get an idea into my head and I just run with it. So he said, well, instead of writing a book, let's do a blog. I'll set you up with a blog and you can get into the habit of writing. Um, so he helped me set it up. And liveon.com.au was launched and this is my writing blog. I poured my heart out in that blog. Um, I wrote every day, I never missed a day. Um, it wasn't all serious, there's lots of funny stuff in it too. My parents were, I think you're probably all old enough to remember KTEL products. Um, my KTEL, my parents were KTEL devotees. Um, you know, they just, oh my God, they drove me crazy. We all had split lips from those beautiful amber tumblers made out of beer bottles that my dad thought were great. Um, and my mother had a collection of false teeth that I kept finding years after she died in tins. Um, so I wrote, I wrote about all that stuff as well. When I travelled overseas, it became a travel blog. When something happened in my family, it became a diary. Um, it became a psychologist and a friend to me, really. I was able to reflect on my life and it was really therapeutic. And I quickly gained a following. And about six months into it, I won International Blogger of the Year for Star Central magazine. I had a lot of friends who voted. I'm not that good. I had a lot of friends who voted. Um, that was quickly followed up by winning the Australian Writers' Centre Most Outstanding Advocacy blog for a piece I wrote about White Ribbon. So that was when I realised that I really couldn't keep pinching other people's photos from Google and I really should learn to make them myself. You know, I was always taking memes and stuff and, um, and while I really wasn't doing anything greatly wrong because I credited where I got them from and stuff, I realised I really had to do that myself. So I decided I was going to do a little photography course. How many of you started with this obsession with that? A little photography course. Um, and there wasn't much available that I could afford, so I enrolled in Cert 4 at Photo Imaging at TAFE. So I was 51 years old and I'm starting TAFE. I walked into a classroom and it's full of kids. The youngest was 17. There were a few in their early 30s, but not only was I older than most of them, but I was older than their parents. And they told me regularly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I was only staying till I got the hang of the DSLR and I figured that would take me about six weeks. <laughs> yep. So by week five, I finally took a photo of a polystyrene ball that was almost recognisable and didn't quite look like a snowstorm. Um, I still had no idea where that little red square inside the eyepiece was from. I just thought that was a decoration. <laughs> um, and I couldn't believe this could be so damn hard. And after about four months in, I was giving up. Um, everyone else was taking photos, really good photos, and mine looked like crap. So then I found out about their dirty little secret. They all had Lightroom. I hadn't heard of Lightroom. So amping up the contrast and clarity on every single photo I took, I started to feel a little bit more confident. I don't now when I look back. I look back and think, oh God, what were you thinking? But um, it felt good at the time. Um, I became very close to Kirsty, so while I call Kirsty my daughter, we actually met in the class and she was a daughter without a mum and I was a mum without a daughter and we were just a good fit. So uh, she's now daughter of my heart. Um, and so we used to do a lot of photography together. She would model for me and all sorts of stuff. And um, we went for a walk to Blackheath one morning. Now, I don't like morning and I don't like walking, um, but I went and I was ready to give up. And then I took this photo of um, Blackheath. And it's not the best I've seen. I've seen a lot better photos of that particular scene, but I was so thrilled that I finally did it. That was the photo that was my watershed moment that went, oh my God, I can actually do this. So that photo is really, really special to me. Um, so with this group of kids that I was in this class with, um, I've not only found a passion, but I've also found a tribe. These kids kept me going. So it's, it's, you know, I was ageist. I was the one that was going, oh my God, these kids are all too young, but they kept me going. Um, and then we had to do a self-portrait. So I'd always been interested in composite photography. And I decided that I was going to show the world the face that I show the world compared to what I really feel inside. It's one of the worst composite photos ever, but I was so proud of myself when I did it, and it took me ages to do. 
Um, and I knew it wasn't right, but I knew that I had to keep working at Photoshop. Um, so at the end of the six month course, I was taking some okay stuff. So I thought, what the hell, I'm gonna go back and do diploma. So my six week course <laughs> that I was hoping for just blew out to 18 months. But that's when I really fell in love with photography. There was more freedom to play. And when we finished my diploma, exhibition Im images were all fairy tale themed, all of them. So I knew which way I wanted to take my photography. So instead of going that way, I threw myself into weddings and events and stuff like that, and I absolutely hated it. Um, I found it so stressful and my anxiety would go through the roof, so I started to make art just for myself. And with no pressure on me to conform to a client's expectations, I found freedom to allow my imagination to run wild. I watched tutorials online every single morning. I never missed a morning of tutorials to learn as much as I could about Photoshop, and I started to make stuff that I could like. So one night while I was playing with images, a mermaid was born, and her name is Hope. And that comes from a, a quote from The Little Mermaid that says, when the world says give up, hope whispers try one more time. Um, and yeah, she was my watershed in. She's not the best, but I absolutely adore her. Um, and then I wanted to show what stepping into a book felt like for me as a child. So I created All the Places You Go and that won the Greenwood Centre Child Care Centre's art prize. And I was blown away. I was just gobsmacked that I could win something. Um, because I, my depression at the time was absolutely ridiculous. Um, you might have noticed I work in a square format. I'm a very symmetrical person. I love symmetry. Um, and it also sort of takes it out of photographic mode a little bit. and takes it into more of a painterly mode, which I love painterly images. Um, but it's also just convenient to always know that I've got a square format, so frames are really easy to swap around. Um, so in 2016, I was encouraged to enter Blue Fringe Art Prize. Have any of you heard of Blue Fringe? Okay, Blue Fringe. Blue Fringe has been running for 20, uh, this year will be 27 years. Um, and it's for people with a lived experience of mental illness. Um, and since I think we're now to one in three people in Australia have mental illness, it's, it's open to almost everybody. Um, and it's run every year at the Webber Falls TAFE. And some of the images, we've got photography, sculpture, art and textiles. And some of the art is amazing. And when you see what some people are living with, um, the degree of mental illness or the degree of physical illness that has caused a mental illness. The work is amazing. If you've never seen it, honestly, get down and see it. It's in October, it coincides with uh, Mental Health Month. This year I'm a featured artist. I won't be entering this year, but I'm a featured artist. So you might notice the girl in the bath. That's Kirsty. <laughs> Um, I won that year, it was my first year of entering and I won the main prize. And at the time I was pretty much basket case material, I really and truly was. Things had just hit absolute rock bottom for me. And that winning that prize made me go, wow, like maybe I do have something to offer the world because I actually didn't feel like I had anything. Um, Last year in 2018, in 2017 I was busy and I didn't enter, but in 2018 I entered again and I won again with um, the other photo which is at the grave of her dreams. Um, sorry, at the grave of broken dreams, I don't know my own art. Um, and this body of work has just been shown as an exhibition, as Tim said, called From Fracture to Fairy Tale, and it was on at Wentworth Falls at the Wild Valley um, Art Park. So the exhibition was an immersive installation with six chapters telling the story of my life as a fairy tale. There were eight images in each of the four chapters, um, first four chapters, and as you step through the cover of a huge book, um, that I made, it was massive, um, you step through the cover and into the story. This chapter was called Run, Run As Fast As You Can, You Can't Hurt Me on the Storybook Land, and was about the sexual abuse as a child and how reading saved me from it. And this, obviously, for those of you who know Enid Blyton, was based on the magic faraway tree. The second chapter spoke about domestic violence, and it was called How Many Flicks Till the Fly Flew Away. 
Uh, it was projected onto a screen in a mini theatre. Um, and that was because at the time I was going through all the domestic violence and the stalking and stuff, I started acting and being able to step into another role and be someone else for two hours every day or every night was just absolute bliss, it was heaven. So that's what this chapter was about. The third chapter was entitled, All the King's Horses and All the King's Men Couldn't Put Money Together Again. And it talks about grief. It was a set of images, they were all printed onto light boxes and illuminated in a dark room. So it certainly um, created that feeling of, of grief and help, uh, hopelessness. The fourth chapter was about mental illness. And this is where it got a little bit fun. Um, it was called when, when they were up, they were up, and when they were down, they were down. And it was set in a circus as I've sort of come to like the way my brain works. And it has a lot of um, similarities, I guess, to a circus. I'm constantly juggling thoughts in my mind. I often walk a tightrope, not knowing which way I'm going to fall. And you know those funhouse mirrors? I have sometimes have a really distorted view of myself. I'm either 10 foot tall and completely unbreakable, or I am just dreadful. So, and I think we all go through that, but certainly when you, when you have a mental illness, um, that's all compounded. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was a circus and it was a lot of fun to be in. So the fifth and sixth chapters were based around two sculptures. So I actually tried my hand at sculpting. Um, the fifth chapter spoke about displacement of home and was called Ladybird, Ladybird, Fly Away Home. The smoke's getting thick and the cameras are on. And the sixth is about my diagnosis and treatment last year for breast cancer because the universe decided that I hadn't had enough in life and just wanted to throw one more thing in. Um, so it showed a large poisoned apple representing cancer in a glass coffin while Snow White, me, there's a lot of photoshopping in that photo, let me tell you, <laughs> um, lives on. So I'm hoping to take this on the road as a travelling exhibition and I've actually been asked to bring it down to Melbourne um, to a domestic violence um, group, so we'll see how we go with that. Um, but I realised when I did that first photo of Blackheath that I was looking for beauty all the time and I started to find it. Because when you look for beauty, you're going to find it. And when you're looking through the lens of a camera, that is really focused completely on what it is you're looking for. Um, and art has become the glue that put me back together again. And it's all basically through the lens of a camera. Even though I will try my hand at other things, it's um, photography that's really been my saving grace. So most of my images speak to social issues, which from Fracture to Fairy Tale definitely did. But sometimes it's about beauty or sadness or just fun. It depends on my mood. But a little bit of me is in every image. So I'm just going to run you through my basic workflow of, of making a composite. I made this particular, not that one, that's just the images that I use, the base images. Um, I made one on Sunday for you to have a look at. Everything in there is mine except for the shipwreck. I didn't have a photo of the shipwreck, so I did use a stock photo that I'm licensed to use. But I'm trying to completely break out of using other people's stock images and where possible taking them myself, unless it's of a spaceship or something, because I don't have them. Um, so this is a photo I took in Ireland um, from the shore of Inishmoor. And it's basically just cloud covering a hazy horizon and ocean in the forefront. And because I worked in a square format, I extended the canvas for that. And all I did, there's lots of ways of doing it. Do any of you use Photoshop? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's lots of ways of doing everything. It's the most annoying program at times because there's too many choices. Um, but what I did was I basically just took this here, I duplicated it, and then I just dragged it down. And yes, it's stretching pixels but I was putting a lot of other stuff on top, so I can afford to stretch pixels when I'm doing that. So I ended up with this. Um, I really tried very hard once I've done the background to put all the elements in, and I try and make everything look as realistic and believable as possible. And then when I've got it all together, that's when I like to add the, um, the elements that make it a little bit more storybook. Um, I take a lot of photos of clouds. People think I'm crazy because I'm always looking up to the sky. Um, but photos of clouds are fantastic for adding fog 
to images and, and to atmosphere. So I put this one on screen, uh, blend mode screen, and it gave it a fog effect on the water. And then the same cloud was duplicated again, and this time it was set to the blend mode was set to darker colour to give it a really stormy look. Using a road from another picture, um, I set this to the side so that the it can just go around the corner and go on and on. Um, I did remove the water that's in that little corner part in here, that in there. I did remove that, but then I decided I liked it in there more. So this is where if you don't work with layer masks on Photoshop, you really need to. Because if I had just erased that, I would never have been able to get it back again. Whereas if you use the um, non-destructive layer mask, it's so much easier. Um, I love working non-destructively. Then I can go back in six years' time if I need to and change it. This is barely noticeable, but I have added rocks over here to this side. So it's barely noticeable, but you would see it in the final product if I didn't add it. Then I added rocks to the foreground for my model to sit on. And then I added more in there. And while that was one photo when I cut it into two, I actually didn't like them very much because they were very blurry. So I added these instead. So I had a beach effect. Well, now it looks like it's a bay, there's waves coming in and I was able to blend it all together. Um, I walked the stone wall, which was actually just a beach, and I walked it to bring it up around the side so it makes it look like it's got some depth. I added the house to the road. That house was also in Ireland, but not there, obviously. Um, and I've added a barrel floating in the water. And to make it look like it's submerged, again, adding a layer mask of, and a brush with reduced opacity. I've just taken a little bit off to brush it away, making it look like it's underwater, so there's still a little bit of the barrel showing. Um, then I added a wave to the barrel, because if it was in the water and the tide was coming in, it would have some white water. A sheep on the side of the road, because why not? Um, and he was originally facing the other way, but I wanted him facing out to sea because that's where all the action was going to be. So I flipped him over and put him there. And then I added a, um, a shadow to him just by duplicating the layer and darkening it. So I just added a shadow to him. And then I added more shadow to ground him completely to the ground. Um, I added a bare branch tree to the house because I'm trying now to tell the story and it's obviously miserable and cold and sad and just not a great place to be unless you're inside that house with the heater on. Um, I added an extra mountain range and you can't really see that that well, but I added an extra mountain range because when I looked closely when I zoomed in I could see the water behind and I didn't want to see that, I wanted to see land. So now I've added my model, and while she's fantastic, the red dress was just wrong. I didn't want a red dress at all. It wasn't the feeling that I was trying to achieve. So I added a hue and saturation level, and again, there's a hundred different ways to change colour in Photoshop, um, but I used the hue saturation layer and changed it to a teal colour. I wanted to mimic the, the ocean, the stormy ocean colour. Um, and I've also there added a shadow around the front of her and some underneath her feet. Um, you'll be able to see on her around here that there's a little bit of lighter colour there. So that tells me where I have to put my um, light source when I bring light in because it's really, it could be either way at this moment in time. The barrel as well, the top of the barrel has a little bit of um, flare there as well. So I have to bring my um, light source in from this side. I wanted her to have a bit more hair to emphasise that windy, horrible feeling. Um, and I also changed the colour to a deeper red and lightened her skin. Again, there's a hundred different ways to do this. I'm really lazy when I work. Um, I do it the quickest and easiest way I can, so I added a layer, I painted her face white, and then I just reduced the opacity and put it onto a soft light blend mode. And that tends to bring, if you look at the skin there, should I go backwards? No, there. The skin there, and then, what have I got? Wrong one. There. So it's just made her.
first inviter. I added a flock of birds over the house and they're just made with um, making my own brushes. So put them all together and just did a flock of birds over the house and reduced the opacity right down so that they look like they're a long way away and they're behind cloud. I added the shipwreck, so this wasn't mine, but I cut the shipwreck out of it. Um, and it starts to explain the story of her grieving over someone lost at sea. So this is a stock photo that I used for that. Um, I added a hue saturation <coughs> layer to darken the, the ship so it wasn't quite so bright. And I added a tear to her face and a, again, a shadow to ground the tear to her face so that it actually makes it look like it's really on there. I added two seagulls um, and I had to flip them around to make sure that again my light source is coming from the left so um, where they were lit up they had to be on the left as well. I submerged a life buoy in the water again adding a mask and brushing part of it away so that it looks like it's submerged um, and now it's time for the light source. So just taking a, a large round brush with a little bit of yellow colour I just put a soft glow behind her um, I wanted to make it fairly low so it looked like it was later on in the day. Um, and then I added a little bit on the side of the house and on the sheep and in the puddles and on the boat and on the birds and on the barrel. Um, and I put a Gaussian blur over the whole layer to spread the light a bit and then set the blend mode to linear light to make it shine and, and glow like the sun would. Um, I added a wave again breaking on the side of the ship and a mid-grey filled layer. So I used this to add highlights and shadows um, using dodge and burn, and then I set it to blend mode overlay. So it starts to give the, if you look at it there, and then look at it there, it starts to really darken it up and the light, a light and bright around her back so that the sun looked like it was shining on there. I added some smoke to the chimney to make the house look like it's inhabited and if you look very closely there is a ghost-like figure in the window and I like to do that sort of stuff, it just it adds a little bit of mystery. When I print my photos they're always quite big but they're quite large images and it's amazing how people can stand and look at them for ages. I know some people say simplicity is the key um, but people love to just look really really closely and see all the different little things in there and I use a lot of symbology in photo uh, in my images. Um, life isn't simple, it's a series of clues joined together and that's how, how I try and make my images as well. I very often <coughs> add a white feather in my photos. Um, again symbology, it, that says to me that there are angels around. So a white feather for me always represents angels and I did um, a ripple effect where the thing was falling. So in the photo, that there is the feather. So while well, you can't see it from a distance, um, when you're actually up close to it, you can. So I added a red sunset photo to the whole image, set the blend, blend mode to soft light at a lower, lower opacity, and put a layer mask on, and just took the bottom of the um, colour off her, and just the bottom of the photo. Um, I've added three textures to the image now, and you can see them over there. So that's the sunset there. That one is an image, and these two are just like a concrete image. So you can see the difference that it makes up here in the sky. Um, textures look beautiful on skies. Um, and then I used, you can see on the mask over here, that I've used a gradient tool to wipe away some of that colour that make it a really gradual, natural effect. Um, added curves layer and another huge saturation layer over the whole image and I've darkened it to look like it's later on in the day and then just reduced the opacity to suit. I added a rainbow to the photo um, and again symbolic it represents hope and a promise of better times ahead um, and I set the blend mode to soft light and just reduced the opacity to make it believable and then to finish the whole image off and this might seem counterproductive to a lot of people, but I always put a sharpening layer on, so a high pass filter to sharpen it, and then I add a noise reduction. I've got the actions on my computer. So I've added a noise reduction to, sh to soften it again. So I sharpen it and then I soften it 
but that gives me the painterly feel that I want. Um, I wouldn't do that if I was doing everyday photography, but for this kind of work, that's exactly the look that I want to achieve. Um, no, so, yeah, so that's the finished, that's it finished. Um, and it's called After the Storm. So, going on to others, um, I'll just go show you through a few before and afters. And like I say, it's all about just finding the imagination, finding something. This one was set up, this wasn't organic. I decided I really wanted to make Kirsty sit in the middle of the hot sun out in a cast iron bath um, with fake flowers all around her. But anyway, um, and you can see that I changed that tap there to over to here, so the other side, just cleaned it all up, you know, put a frame up there as well. Um, and that's wash away the day. This was taken in Wentworth Falls Lake. Um, so I just added those two photos together and obviously put a few, you know, a mermaid, a unicorn and a castle in because they weren't really there. Um, and yeah, so there's um, Once Upon a Dreaming. Now I went to Ireland a couple of years ago and these guys, it was St Pat's Day, they didn't normally walk down the street like that I think. Um, and I met these guys and they were just so much fun so I took a photo of them. And then I went to Tipperary and I took that photo of the bar and decided that they needed to be on the bar in Tipperary. Um, and that's Paul's at Rainbow's End. Um, this is where troubles melt. So I took the top photo um, out of a bus. You can see how blurry it is around the front. Um, I took that out of the window of a bus um, near Stonehenge in England. And I just loved the fact that there was this big hole in the roof and I had, it was such a perfect hole. I didn't understand it. Um, and my niece had a little red car that she called Ruby. So we did a photo shoot and I got a pair of shoes from the op shop and I painted them with red glitter and made her put them on and then um, I ended up making where troubles melt. Um, so we all have a story. This is a hundred stories that I did in 2017. Um, we all have a story and there's nothing more disempowering or damaging to our souls than carrying it untold throughout our life. There's many ways to tell a story. For me, it's a camera, and for most of you, I'm sure it's exactly the same. But no matter what tool we use, we are storytellers. So I will leave you with a quote from one of my favourite, uh, one of my favourite quotes by Jonathan Gottschall. He says, "We as a species are addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories." And I think that's how I feel. So. Thank you. <laughs> Storyteller, that's verbally and obviously um, through through your images and, and the skill you you put lightning, uh, sorry, lightning Photoshop to use with is is something something to behold. Um, I you know it's it's one thing from Andrew Hall's I think we had the last um, last month. And he was, in his way, a natural storyteller story mm. too, just so, it just flew mm. from, from his, his lips and um, life. Mm. Yes? That fascinating story with the Photoshop, with the sea and, the, yep. and everything else, you kept adding more and more. At what point did you realise what story you wanted? But we're just not satisfied. Okay, I'll have a rainbow, I'll have a bird, I'll have a clear barrel well. You know, it just yeah. kind of goes on and on. Um, Incredibly complex. It was just fantastic. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that they all happen, or they generally happen organically. Um, when I did my exhibition, I planned everything, and that was really uncomfortable for me, having to plan a photo, draw it out, this is what I'm going to do. I really struggled with that. Um, whereas working organically like that particular photo. Um, I generally, once 
there'll be there'll be one thing I think, and for me that was the girl. I could tell that that was from a very old photo shoot I did, and she looked so bereft. She looked like she was unhappy in the photo, and so from there I added the story. Um, and I knew I wanted an ocean, so I knew I wanted to be near the ocean. And so then there had to be a reason why she was bereft, so the shipwreck came in. Um, as to when I know it's finished, I often don't. <laughs> um, learning when to stop is really difficult, but generally you'll get to one point and you'll just go, that's it. I've done everything I need to do and I'm happy with it. Then I generally give myself a couple of days and I go back and revisit and I generally add more or I take something away. Um, but yeah, there does come a time where you just know that the story is actually told, it's finished, and that's the end. Can I just reverse my question? Yep. How many of those photos, images, did you have before you started to tell the story? Oh. You, have, you have them all beforehand. Yep. Okay, yep. So, so the concept was that I've got all these, mm. the girl was the focus of my story, yep. and I'm going to build it into this tale. Yep. You didn't have to go and say, oh God, I've got to take a cloud, I need to go and find a no. sheep. Okay. No, no, I, I have a fairly large stock library of my own um, and a lot of that, a lot of those photos were based in Ireland, even though they were all in different parts of Ireland, they were all pretty much from Ireland, so um, that's generally good because all the lighting will be pretty much the same, especially in Ireland, it's pretty much all miserable. Um, I love Ireland, I am Irish. Um, um, so yeah, so all the lighting and everything is the same, which makes it a bit easier. But if I had something that I was really going out to do, like the photo of Kirsty in the bath, um, yeah, that was that was a bit of a different thing. I had to have everything there because it was really bright sunlight, and had I tried to take stuff from other places, it wouldn't have uh, blended in very easily. Yeah. Where to? Where to now? What's the next step? Um, I'm hoping to take the the exhibition further. Um, as part of the exhibition I made a, I wrote a full fairy tale to go with all the photos, so the whole book is in there. Um, so I'd really like to take that. I mean it is the story of my life, but it is a fairy tale and it, it touches a lot of people and I had, have any of you been to Wild Valley Art Park in Mugler Falls? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you have to go down a really, really long dirt road. It is a really off the beaten track place to access, um, and we got over two hundred and seventy people through, which I was blown away with. I was really blown away with. Um, and as people came through, I had people coming through crying because it affected their life. They were triggered by something, um, or. Some came through really happy going, oh, this is just so joyous. So I think the comments that I got and the people coming through, it made me realise that it's a very powerful story and it needs to go to other places. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm hoping to take that to other places. Even when I was in the middle of it all, I already had the next four or five things, photos planned, um, or, you know, just ideas. Um, I'm hoping to do a ballerina series soon. So, I don't know, just carry on as... As usual, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Did you, the skills you picked up on Photoshop, a lot of them came from courses you did that uh, <laughs> I would love to tell you that was the case, but no, it wasn't. I swear. <laughs> yeah, but, um, it, they were supposed to teach us Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, they failed. Four months into the course before <laughs> I actually realised that Lightroom was an issue. They didn't teach it. They should have, but they didn't. Um, so no, nearly everything I've learned, I've learned from tutorials on YouTube mm -hmm. um, or on Creative Live, one of those things. And there, so, sorry? Or by accident. Um, In terms of experiments. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, sometimes, you know, somebody else will say, oh, do you realise you could do that this way? And you go, oh really, that's so easy. Um, so yeah, so but basically everything I've picked up Pretty much by myself <coughs> with the help of Dr. Google. Yeah. yeah, and Chris asked that Denise and I did a course, and the young guy there, he goes, Oh, you've got that. And we're still looking around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, it's years ago when I first saw Photoshop, my son kept saying to me, He's a bit of a, a technical guy, and he'd say to me, Mum, it's all about layers. You've just got to do layers. And I was like, 
no, nah, I cannot do it, I don't want to learn. Um, when I realised how powerful it was and exactly what you could do with it, I knew that I had to learn it. And nowadays he phones me and says, Mum, how do you do that in Photoshop? <laughs> so that makes me extremely proud. 